All right, brethren. Now on to this topic. <laughs> Implication Sabbath. Attend services on Sabbath? Is that really a commandment? Must we really attend a so-called church service on Sabbath or Sunday or on a particular day of the week? Now you've heard this demand before. Bless God, you've got to be in church every time the doors open. And if you don't, you're wicked. Is this true? I've heard preacher after preacher from Baptist churches to Bible college pound on pulpits, etc., yell and scream, spit flying, telling us, Bless God, you have to be in church every time the door is open, and if you're not, you're not right with God. Is there really a commandment in Scripture for this? No, there isn't. Let's prove our case. Now, before we do, a lot of you Sunday churchgoers and uh, professing Sabbath keepers who also go to church services on Sabbath really want to object and call me a heretic and say I'm a heathen and I'm out of the will of God. Because I believe you don't have to be in church on one of those days. Listen. Listen to what I had to say. Look at the facts in this video. And then you can make your own conclusion. But don't be a dumb idiot and open your mouth and spot out hot air in haste in the flesh without first seeing the evidence. Take heed of this verse here. You better watch that. All right? Now let's begin. Let's look at the classic commandment of keeping the Sabbath from the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Watch how God tells us to keep the Sabbath. Verses 9 through 10. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Okay. Where's the commandment? And be in a church service. It's not there. Also, how can you make sure thy son or thy daughter thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, are resting properly if you're going to someone's house for a Sabbath meeting. Especially if you believe in going to a temple church building. See my series about that. Hmm? Do you have an answer for that, churchgoers? You probably don't. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Oh, so God set the example of how to keep the Sabbath. Did he go to church somewhere? No, he sure didn't mention it. But let's give God the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he'll add it in his later edition of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5. I mean, let's just look at it from the positive viewpoint that perhaps God may have accidentally left it out, which is not possible in his perfect moral nature. But let's just say it's true. I'm in a generous mood. Let's grab this proposition that just possibly God may have forgotten to put it in as illogical and erroneous and fallacious as that sounds. But let's just go on with that theory for a moment. Let's go to Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. Now look at this passage here. We won't read the verses for the sake of time. But as you read through these verses here, hmm, no mention of going to a church service here either. Well, Maybe God just forgot to command it. <laughs> Once again, as illogical and impossible as that sounds. Or maybe 
Just maybe. Attention! The Sabbath has nothing to do with attending a church service. How about for our next point, the word convocation? A big word. A four syllable word people want to toss around to make them sound intelligent and prove their point that you have to be in a church service. Let's first define it from Webster's 1828. The act of calling or assembling by summons, an assembly. Okay, it means an assembly. But does this mean necessarily a crowd of people? Yes. Let's quickly define the word assembly, Webster's 1828 again. A company or collection of individuals in the same place, usually for the same purpose, a congregation or religious society convened. The word convocation or convocations is only found 18 times in the Old Testament only. Interesting, not found in the New Testament anywhere. Also, in every occurrence, it is referring to the feasts. Yes, every time. But you say, no, wait a minute, Anthony. What about Leviticus 23, 2 through 3? Okay, let's read that. Leviticus 23, 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Okay, now, brethren, watch carefully. Also, if you are a Sunday professing churchgoer, Watch carefully. The rest of verse 2 and verse 3. Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest. And holy convocation, ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. It is connecting the Sabbath to the feasts. All of the feasts are called holy convocations. So it is illogical to use this passage to claim that we must go to a church service on Sabbath. If it is true that we have to make the Sabbath from the Ten Commandments of the Moral Law to be a holy convocation, then why didn't God say so in Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5? I mean, you would think that even after the second attempt of giving the Ten Commandments, he would have mentioned it, right? Part 2. New Testament passages. This is going to be exciting, because every passage that people want to use in the New Testament, that we have to be in a church service on Sabbath or any particular day of the week, has nothing to do with the issue, I mean, it's amazing how either people are willingly ignorant and stupid, and they twist the scripture unto their own destruction. See this passage here? Interesting. Or, they are sincerely ignorant, but they're sincerely wrong. They mean well, but they twist the scripture unto their own destruction still. It is vitally important that whenever you reference a passage of scripture, you need to make sure your doctrine consistently agrees with what the text says, not by what your opinion is. Therefore, to be consistent to use this passage to believe that we are to be in a church service on Sabbath as commandment from God, then you also need to do these things in the following passages. Let's begin. Matthew 12. Oh boy, a common passage used. Verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were unhungered, and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. He wasn't in church. What's he doing wandering in the cornfield eating? And he influenced his own disciples to do the same thing. Huh. Is that really God-honoring? Did Jesus do something wrong? Now, for the rest of the verses, we probably won't read all of them for the sake of time. Let's look at verse number 2. As you look at this verse here, 
these Pharisees got mad and accused him of so-called not lawful activity. They had their own version of the Sabbath. I mean, think about it. They added their own commandments from men. You can't heal, help someone, ox in the ditch scenario. Can't pull a chair across the room, raise the dead, miracle of Christ, etc. None of these are commanded against in the Old Testament. Think about that. Verse number 8. <laughs> this is a funny statement. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. This is funny. It's like Christ needed to remind them that he's the boss. He may have been thinking, well, duh. I created and sanctified the Sabbath. Don't you think that if it was not lawful to eat corn on the Sabbath, I would have known that? I mean, come on. Verse 9. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. So, here people want to say, See? He's going to church! Uh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. A synagogue is not a gathering place for the church, body of Christ. You'll see why soon. Verse 10. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? That they might accuse him. So they're asking him a trap question. This type of question isn't wrong to ask. It has its place at the appropriate time. However, the why for asking is the first question to answer. The Pharisees' reason was to trap him and expose him. Hence the last statement that they might accuse him. Also, they're asking about the Sabbath days, plural. They're still stuck on the feast days and ceremonial law. It is true that the ceremonial law ended when Christ was resurrected from the dead. But the Pharisees asking the question were heathens and did not believe he was the Messiah. Very evident. Now, if this is a proof text from church-going people, then why would you want to be in a place where you could get asked trap questions on purpose that they might accuse you in front of everybody? Not a place for true Christians, that's for sure. Verse 11, And he said unto them, What men shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? Notice he avoids their foolish question, coming from the fool, Proverbs 26.4, and asks the crowd a question in the synagogue. Also, he addresses the Sabbath day, singular, not Sabbath days, because he is the end of the ceremonial law, Romans 10.4, addresses the ceremonial law as being ended. Interesting. Verse 12. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. He established that it is lawful to do well on the, in the Sabbath days. You see how he went back to the plural context of the Pharisee's question? He did answer them after he explained the fact that it was the Sabbath day according to the moral law. You see, the Pharisees were asking him a question that tied all the Sabbaths together. You see how crafty they were being? While denying Christ in their heart, attempting to tie him to the ceremonial law as requiring him to do it. Very crafty indeed. Now. For the sake of time, we won't read verses 13 through 15, but in these verses, Christ healed the, the man. Then the Pharisees had a group meeting of destroying him. Christ then, knowing this, left the synagogue, causing multitudes to follow him. So, he probably didn't even stay until the end of the service. So, if this passage is an example of how we should go to a church service on Sabbath, then I have three questions. First, why should we go to a synagogue where false, accusing, deceitful heathens gather? 
Two, should I be afraid of being destroyed from other professing Christians? Three, isn't there supposed to be unity in the body of Christ and not deceivers? On to our next passage, Mark chapter 1. Verse 21, And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. To show consistency in this passage, with the belief that we have to be in a church service on Sabbath, then we also need to do these things. 1. We have to go to Capernaum. 2. We have to enter a synagogue of the Jews and teach. If you're not going to do that, you're not being consistent in your argument of belief, are you? Next, Mark chapter 6. Also see as cross-references Luke 4, 16-31 and chapter 13, 10-35. Very interesting chapters also. Beginning in verse number 1 through 2, And he went out from thence, and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Once again, many professing Sabbath keepers want to yell, Ah, oh, see! He and his disciples went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day to be among brethren, true believers. How do you know they were true believers in the synagogue? You don't. In fact, according to the scripture text, I'll prove to you why most of them were not. Hint, and many hearing him were astonished. Keep that phrase in mind. Verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and of Judah, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Therefore, many, read the previous verse carefully, were offended because he taught with such authority and were astonished. How can somebody be offended at the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, and be a true believer? And what was Jesus Christ's response? Do you know what his response was? Read on. Verse 4. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Well, guess what? The Lord Jesus Christ was looked upon as without honor, according to the Jews in the synagogue and his own family. And this is supposed to be a passage to push the belief that we are to be in a church service on Sabbath? Well, if that's the case, then you need to consistently go to a Jewish synagogue where most heathens gather, Christ rejectors, and teach, causing them to be offended and astonished at your doctrine and to be looked at without honor. Consistency Where's the consistency, professing churchgoers? Let me just point this out first of all, in case you're wondering this, I'm not against gathering with brethren. But the whole point of this video is to refute the idiotic, illogical notion that there is a commandment that we have to assemble on a particular day, on a particular time. I'm for gathering with brethren. But nowhere in scripture does it say we have to do it at a particular place or time. Fact. Moving on, Acts chapter 13. Here's another passage that's grossly misinterpreted. I mean, good night. <laughs> really erroneous indeed. Beginning with verses 13 through 14. Now when Paul and his company looked from Paphos, they came to Perga in Paphilia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Of course, you know by now what these church service-going Sabbath keepers are saying. Aha! Now we have the evidence. Paul and his friends went to Sabbath service and sat down. They were in church. 
Wrong. Read on. Verses 15 through 16. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue said unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up, and beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. Hmm. Again, as pointed out many times be before, every word counts in the King James Bible text. The ruler said, Ye men and brethren. And Paul said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God. Both addressed to two different groups of people, the heathen and the saints. Of course, the Jewish rulers of the synagogue believed that all natural-born Jews and those who keep the whole law of Moses by their traditions are brethren. The Jews in the synagogue read a portion of the law, then asked for comments. Paul stood and spoke. See verses 17 through 41. But let's pick up in verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Interesting that the Gentiles wanted them to preach those words to them on the next Sabbath. But the Jews didn't say anything, they just left. Verses 43-44 through 44. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Many of these Jews basically encouraged Paul and Barnabas to continue in the grace of God. Then the whole city assembled, right? But do you really think these Jews were all brethren as saints? You will see they were not. 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Interesting reaction. 46 through 47. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Paul boldly told those defiant Jews that the word was first spoken unto them, but seeing that they rejected it, they turned to the Gentiles. 48-49 And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. The Gentiles rejoiced that salvation was granted to them, but we don't see in this passage of context, the Jews rejoicing. I wonder why. Verse 45, for envy. And what was the response from the Jews as the result from their envy? Verse 45. Let's read on. 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Wow. Not much of a good church experience, is it? Is this what we should expect to happen at a church service among so-called brethren on the Sabbath, since Scripture says we should not bring any burden on it? See these passages here? No, this should never happen. 51 through 52 But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. The disciples' apostles just blew it off and walked away rejoicing for their persecution and went somewhere else. Therefore, if people are going to use a passage like this to conclude that we have to be in a church service on Sabbath, that we have a very bitter church service experience here. In this case, we are expected to be persecuted for speaking the truth from heathens gathered among two brethren then leaving, perhaps, in the middle of service, and lastly, going somewhere else rejoicing of our persecution. Come on now. Not a good passage to use for your argument. 
particular day churchgoers. How about Acts 15? Wow, another classic passage. <laughs> another common passage people twist to preach that they were in a church service on Sabbath. Verses 1-2 through two, And certain men which came down from Judea taught their brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas, and certain other of them, should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So there's a dispute about this question of circumcision and the law of Moses as a requirement for salvation. So a meeting was set up in Jerusalem with the other apostles to discuss the matter. 5. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Here's a key verse. This certain group of the Pharisees which believed were pushing this issue as a requirement for salvation, which is false doctrine. I don't know. Uh, maybe they got messed up in the Hebrew Roots movement or something. You think? Now in verses 6 through 11, to speed things up, as they all came together to consider this matter, Peter gave the conclusion that the gospel by the grace of God is how people are saved not by circumcision or the law of Moses regarding the ceremonial Levitical law. To pick it up again in verse 21, it says, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Now look, brethren, this is a, another verse that people twist to prove their opinionated belief. Just because Peter made the statement, that Moses is read every Sabbath day. That doesn't mean they were in a church service on the Sabbath for this meeting, and this is very stupid thinking. I mean, that is very stupid thinking indeed. What a way to twist a verse to make it say what it does not say. 22. Then please it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men out of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barzabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. Notice, no evidence in this verse especially that they were in a church service on the Sabbath day. Oh, but people say, Well, Anthony, the statement says, With the whole church. And you were going somewhere with this. <laughs> I mean, what's your point? Are you serious? There's many times the church met in groups or a small assembly, and it wasn't on the Sabbath day. Did you know that they also met on the first day of the week? <gasps> on the first day of the week? Sunday, Anthony? Are you serious? Yes. This is our next point. The first day of the week, Sunday. Buckle up. John twenty nineteen. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Notice, brethren, it says, the same day at evening. That's interesting. Another proof text in simple English that the new day does not begin in the evening. If it did, then the text is wrong. If you can't read plain English, you have no business elaborating on what you think it means. Therefore, shut up! I know the disciples were gathered on the first day of the week because they feared the Jews. I know about that. However, they still gathered on that day. Were they wrong? I think not. And what was Jesus' response to his apostles? Was it, Why aren't you in a church service on Sabbath? Why are you gathering on the first day of the week? You're sinning against my holy Sabbath, for it's supposed to be a holy convocation unto you. Haven't you ever read Leviticus 23, you morons? Is that what he said? No. Notice, and take note, carefully, it says, Jesus and stood in the midst, 
and saith unto them, What did he say? What did he say? Was it, You cowards! Why are you afraid of the Jews and not assembling on the Sabbath like you're supposed to? Don't you trust me to protect you? No, he said, Peace be unto you. Hmm. Looks much like Matthew 18.20, For where two or three are gathered to gather in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Looks like Jesus is consistent, obviously. By the way, why peace? Read these, Psalms 119, verse 165 to 166. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. Could it be that the apostles knew very well that not assembling on the Sabbath was not against the law? And could it be, just maybe, that they knew as well as Jesus Christ himself that there's nothing sinful about gathering on a day like Sunday? I think so. Verses 20-21 through 21, And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. So the Lord is not mad at them at all. You would think he would rebuke them sharply for gathering on the first day of the week if it was sinful, right? I don't think the apostles were sitting there staring at Jesus and thinking, Whew! Wow, what a relief. I'm glad he's not mad that we're not gathering on the Sabbath. You think they were scared to death that he was going to get on to them and lecture them and rebuke them sharply for not gathering on the Sabbath day in a church service? Are you kidding me? Get your head straight. Next, Acts chapter 20, verses 1 and 6. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto them the disciples, and embraced them, and departed for to go into Macedonia. And we sailed away from Philippi, after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them in Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. Here comes Paul and the disciples traveling, right? Verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continue his speech until midnight. So they broke bread on the first day of the week, and Paul preached. So we have here a church service that's not on Sabbath. So either Paul was willfully ignoring the Torah, though it's not even recorded that we had to assemble on the Sabbath because it's a tradition of the Pharisees. Or, Paul knew that the Torah is not against meeting outside of Sabbath and not even on the Sabbath for church service. Which one do you side with? Hmm? Hebrews 10. Here's the last passage misused by these Pharisees, Sabbath keepers. 10.24 And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. What good works are we talking about? Gathering in a church service on Sabbath? Is that what the text says in the next verse? No. Verse 25 Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Does it say anywhere in this verse about gathering on Sabbath? No, it does not. How about any other day specifically? No. Therefore the verse does not say when, how often, or even how long to gather. For this next point, but your response is, Anthony, it's implied. Ah, uh, jeez. Ah, uh, Lord God Almighty, help me. <sighs> Another very common word that people misuse. <laughs> what a bunch of idiots. Let's define the term, okay? 
we have to deal with this because I hate when this verse is, because I hate it when, we have to define this term because I hate it when this word is used. Ah, jeez. Webster's 1828, imply. Literally, to enfold or involve, to wrap up, to involve or contain in substance or essence, or by fair inference, or by construction of law, when not expressed in words. Remember, there are two types of implications. The evident implication and empty implication. Short illustration. I see a man walking. Therefore, it can be applied that he can fly. No, not true. An implication is merely an opinion, not absolute or fact. Note that. Let's go about evident implication illustrations. For example, a doctor says to you, you have a disease. So you go to two or three other doctors, and they give you a different conclusion. The common rule is to get a second opinion when a doctor gives you a conclusion. Therefore, it can be implied that doctors give varied opinions. Why? Because an implication coexists with observation or experience, which is equal to fact and reality. So to imply anything, it must coexist with fact and reality, not by fairy tales and feelings. Another example. You see a man with his wife, and there is no evidence of domestic violence, substance abuse, or infidelity. Therefore, it can be implied that the man loves his wife and is loyal to her. But here's an example proof of an implication not being fact. Do you know as fact that he's not cheating on his wife or beating her? No, you don't. So you only have an opinion conclusion. Illustration 3. Or even as a side illustration, a new employee is hired to a job. Therefore, the boss can imply that they will be faithful to the job and punctual. Why? Because he has a good employment record. Therefore, if it is to be implied that we are to meet in a church service on Sabbath, then there must be a pattern of evidence to justify the implication. Is there evidence that people went to a synagogue or taught people on the Sabbath? Yes. However, is there evidence in Scripture of people meeting together on Sabbath for the purpose of believing that the Sabbath was meant to go to a church service and rest? Is there evidence for that? No. Those are two different things. Also, do you know for a fact that God specifically gives a commandment, absolute, of gathering together on Sabbath? No, you don't. So, any implication you give based upon these passages is only an opinion of something you cannot prove. In which case, you need to discard that opinion because there is no evidence to support your belief based upon the evidence that has nothing to do with your belief because it is the irrelevant, irrelevant scenario. It's a scenario you're just making up and twisting it to make it fit your opinion. That makes you a false teacher. So you cannot repeat. You cannot use this passage or any other passage in Scripture consistently with the belief that we have to attend for church service on a particular day. If you do, then one of two options are true of you. One, you're adding to the text of the Word of God, which would make you a liar. Proverbs 36. Option number two, you can't read plain English. This would tell me that you either need to learn to read, which is no problem because we can help you with that, or you're just simply being willfully ignorant and stupid, and you live in a fairy tale fantasy while pretending the verse says what it does not say, which would prove we cannot take you seriously 
as a professing believing student of God's word because you're inserting imaginary statements that are not there. Which, of course, is why we don't believe schizophrenic people when they tell us about their friends. Conclusion. There you have it. There is not one scripture passage that commands for us to have to be in a church service on Sabbath. Every one of these New Testament passages people misuse and claim, Jesus was in church on the Sabbath, and the apostles went to church on the Sabbath, therefore you need to also. They're just blowing out hot air and don't know what they're talking about. There is nothing sinful about gathering outside of Sabbath. And there's nothing wrong or sinful about not gathering together on Sabbath. And anybody who tells you otherwise, they can blow it out their nose because they're more concerned with what they are taught and their opinions than what Scripture actually says. Brethren, you do not have to be in a so called church service on Sabbath or Sunday or any other particular day of the week. Either you believe the scripture or you do not. Assembling together as brethren is important. Yes, I agree. I even do that. But since I'm not a people person on Sabbath, I don't want to be around anybody. Am I sinning? No. As long as I do meet with the brethren on occasional occasions, I'm fine. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, Hebrews 10. Yes, that is true, but it does not have to be on Sabbath or any other day. To all brethren, love the Lord Jesus Christ, fear God and keep his commandments, believe the scripture as it is written, to rest on the Sabbath as it is stated. And read and believe the King James Bible. Thanks.